So, it's quarter past three. I'm Tapio Salonen. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me as a pro vice chancellor to greet you all. Welcome to this special event in our university. As you know, Malmö University is a young, urban, striving university, and we have, as you know, become fully fledged university and will take decisive steps to address uh, future uh, societal challenges in our research and education. And in order to mark this new status, the university has launched a number of activities this year. Uh, among those, this uh, series of seminars, Knowledge for Change. These seminars will, uh, with international well-known scholars, uh, will highlight central challenges for our university. And I'm especially honored to introduce today's speaker, Jöran Terborn, who is a professor emeritus of sociology at the University of Cambridge in UK, and he has been a co-director of the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences, and held chairs of sociology in Sweden and in political science in the Netherlands. He has worked on all the populated continents. Listen to that. He has worked on all populated continents. His work has appeared in 24 languages in a 50-year extremely productive and outstanding academic production. Uh, including the classic, what does the ruling class do when it rules, back in the mid-70s, from Marxism to post-Marxism. And in one of his more recent books, The Killing Fields of Inequality, which came 2013 in Swedish, Ujemlikhet Döda, på Daidalos, he brings inequality to the fore expanding the inquiry into the roots of inequality, undoubtedly one of the key problems of our time, if not the most important. It is a wide, insightful examination of the various dimensions of inequality in a global perspective, distinguishing between different forms of inequality. And in his latest book, from 2017, Cities of Power, he asked questions like, why are some cities more powerful than others? What makes a capital city different from others in a nation state? What kind of power does the urbanity of cities manifest and represent? So, in today's lecture, Urban Imaginations and the Social dim Dynamics of the 21st Century, we look really forward to hear more about these crucial issues. Please give a warm hand to Jöran Tabo. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. I mean, it's a great pleasure uh, being here. And uh, uh, it's almost being uh, present at the baptism of a, uh, a new institution. And, and uh, so it's, it's really uh, a great pleasure. And um, to some extent, it's a, it's a return to a, a, a city, although I'm, I'm here, I mean, only for this brief visit, but in the, in the mid-1960s, I actually lived in, in, in Malmö. I have some interesting experiences from that period, which I'm not going to bore you with, but... Um, um, now, the, um, this uh, uh, seminar uh, series, I mean, has 
the the title of knowledge for what and uh, uh, knowledge for change. Sorry, uh, and I thought that I should uh, take you seriously and and uh, say uh, before I'm going to talk about urban imaginations and social dynamics, but I also want to think to, to say something about uh, knowledge, uh, which seems to me relevant. I mean. Uh, in the context, given the series and, and given the uh, strategies for the new university which are being uh, built up. So this is what you're in for. What knowledge for what? And um, so I want to say something about the specificity of social knowledge. And the reason for that is because I'm a social scientist. So I mean, I, Otherwise, I would have talked about other kinds of knowledge. Uh, and I would like to uh, highlight the dialectics of social cognition. That I, uh, we have to, uh, as social uh, students, uh, whether in the social sciences or in the humanities, or for that matter, even in, in, in law, to uh, uh, deal with the, the, the specific dialectics of social cognitions. And then the, um, the kind of knowledge which I will uh, deal with uh, uh, more concretely and elaborately would deal with urban imaginations, uh, theorizations, visions of the city today. Uh, and I will present a kind of a critical uh, overview of the dominant themes of the current literature and I'll present uh, at least as a sketch a kind of alternative to that uh, perspective. And what change? Uh, well, uh, I will focus on, on the um, twin processes of global urbanization and reurbanization. I'll explain uh, in a minute what I mean by re-urbanization. And the social dynamics of cities will be the kind of process I'm going to, to uh, talk about. What are they, the contexts in which cities today I mean, have, to, have to operate? Uh, and uh, from where do the challenges, the social challenges, uh, coming to um, to cities. So this is uh, uh, what what you can expect. Uh, nothing more, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, social knowledge is in in uh, has some specificities uh, in comparison with the with the knowledge produced by the by the hard sciences. And one uh, uh, of the uh, uh, specificities of social knowledge is the abundance of it, the abundance of social knowledge, and the abundance of social know knowers, people with, who have social knowledge. If you uh, uh, make the, the uh, uh, somewhat daring and risky uh, uh, discount of, of the world's children, who also have some knowledge, uh, you are, uh, have to relate to five and a half billion adult social knowers in the world. And I think, I mean, one of the uh, major reasons why uh, social scientists don't get the Nobel Prize is that we have so many competitors. Um, and the... Uh, the, the uh, the problem is that uh, we have to take, in principle, we have to take the knowledge of every human being seriously. Uh, that's of course, uh, 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 we have to take the, the knowledge of every human being seriously with whom we are in, in contact or whom we are studying or, or, or dealing with. I mean, uh, even even big data 
yet. I mean, can't can't deal with the knowledge of five and a half billion human beings. Um, and it's particularly important to to pay attention to the knowledge of the powerless, of the uh, marginal, of the uh, unequal, at the, the at the bottom end of the unequal, the, of the pyramids of inequality. I will come to that later on when we'll uh, say a few words about the current situation in in um, in Malmo and the city, the dual city. So, uh, uh, one of the things uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, to learn is to, to respect, I mean, this abundance of social knowledge and to learn how to navigate it and be aware of how do we navigate it as uh, both as, as citizens as well as scholars. And the way we navigate it, uh, simply put, is that we adhere to some kind of existing discourse or discursive formation uh, and go from there. And this kind of discourse or discursive formation which we adhere to uh, can be, uh, 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 we can relate to them because of uh, uh, values or stories uh, or images. But there's also another, th another uh, way of doing it which is uh, by curiosity. I will want to find out something of this world. Um, now, uh, uh, this is the, and that is, of course, I mean, the scholarly, the scholarly road, the, the, the road to, to uh, the road to university is the road of curiosity. Um, and uh, but it's 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 not enough. I mean, to be trained in a, a in a uh, particular uh, uh, discipline and adhering to the discursive formation of a particular discipline, whether it's anthropology or social work or economics uh, or what have you, you also have to be aware of and to learn the range of options, even within this. Uh, uh, disciplines and discursive formations. And that's why I'm going to deal with the range of options for urban studies as an example uh, of this. Now, another uh, question which uh, has come up in the history of social science is the, is the question, where is society? Where is the social? And in the history of social science, uh, uh, there have been uh, four uh, different answers given to it, this question. Uh, the, f the first one was that the uh, society is the universe, or the social is the universally social. Uh, that was, uh, uh, of course, I mean, in, in inspired by the developing uh, uh, natural sciences, uh, uh, biology in, in, in particular, uh, perhaps. And uh, uh, it was also framed in an evolutionary f uh, framework, uh, taken, largely taken, I mean, from biology. Um, so you had a universal development uh, from one kind of society to another from a military to an industrial society, from a feudal to a capitalist and to a social, in the future, to a socialist society, or, or from a, uh, uh, a traditional society, as Max Weber talked about, in, to a rational society. Everything universal. And uh, uh, the... Uh, the countries which hadn't come yet, I mean, to a to a certain stage, they had their future 
uh, already written, written for them by, by other countries. Marx gave, uh, wrote, wrote in, in, in Das Kapital, uh, referring to Germany, uh, the Te Fabula da Narratur. This story is about you, although he, he wrote about England primarily. And the idea was that uh, England today is what Germany will become tomorrow. That was the universal idea of social science, of which there were uh, a number of <coughs> alternatives uh, among the uh, classics. The, uh, to make the story uh, short, uh, the World War I and the uh, hecatomb of the war uh, shattered uh, the, the kind of universal progressive belief of the Belle Epoque. And there were also, uh, the social sciences were uh, entering academia. And there were, in academia, there were already existing disciplines with uh, demands of, of, of evidence and empirical uh, research, which is most of, or many of these universalist conceptions of society couldn't uh, easily <coughs> meet. So what happens then uh, was that uh, the, the, the next answer to where is society, where is the social, is the local, it's the city, as in the, uh, in American sociology, for instance, or it's, uh, it's the village, uh, as in anthropology. Later on, beginning uh, to some extent in the 1930s in the United States and reaching the world after, world war, after, after the Second World War, uh, there was a third answer, that the social is the national and society is, an, is the nation-state social formation. Which was the, 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 uh, the dominant paradigm when sociology and social science, and empirical uh, political science, for instance, arrived here. And, in, um, and it was underpinned by new methods, national accounting in economics, uh, sample surveys in, in sociology and political science. Uh, but then, the, we, we arrive at the, at the recent period where the answer to the question, where is society, is that the society is the globe. This, the social is global. And uh, uh, the beginning of this uh, assertion can be exactly dated to the summer of 1974, when Emanuel Wallerstein published the first volume of the modern world system. It took some time for it to be accepted, and not necessarily in Wallerstein's particular version, but nevertheless, nowadays, I think there is a broad consensus in the social sciences that uh, knowledge is global. It's not, and what does that mean? I mean, that it, it's not universal. Well, the global is always, uh, variable in time and space. And world history is always characterized by cultural variation and unequal interaction. To what extent uh, uh, it's, it's, is world systemic? That's a controversial question. But the, the, the point is, I mean, that the, uh, the social is global. That doesn't uh, mean, of course, that uh, uh, everybody nowadays in the social science and the humanities is studying uh, the, uh, the globe. Um, but what it means is that each one of us, I mean, has, has to take into account the global context of whatever local phenomenon 
a, a, a city or a village or a region or a country or whatever uh, uh, we are uh, studying. And um, so that's a, 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 that about the, the uh, evolution of social knowledge. But there are a couple of other things I would like to, to say in, in, in general, uh, which is the, the general question, knowledge for what? The classical answer of the Enlightenment was that knowledge is for emancipation. Knowledge is freedom and equality. Uh, sapere aude, uh, dare to know, was the slogan of the Enlightenment, formulated by Immanuel Kant. It was directed against all kinds of dogmatism, mysticism, uh, metaphysics, uh, uh, and, and uh, mythology. And I think, I think I would guess that probably each one of us here consider her or himself as an heir to the Enlightenment in some respect. And, and rightly so. I do that myself. Uh, but we should also remember the critique of the Enlightenment. Not the critique of uh, royalist and religious reaction, the counter-enlightenment of the Nestre and, and, uh, and others, but the, the critique of it, which first developed by Nietzsche and then in, in modern times has been taken up uh, primarily by Michel Foucault. And it's, uh, it's an important pointer to the fact that knowledge can also be knowledge for domination, knowledge for the governing of people, for governmentality, um, for directing people in whatever direction you want them to go. And this is something, I mean, we, we also have to reflect about. That knowledge is in, inherently uh, ambiguous. And we may uh, uh, illustrate this pro the problematic of knowledge with, uh, with a brief look at an example of the knowledge economy. Um, this is the, uh, the cost of an iPhone and its proportions of the US sales price. This is the iPhone 7. I know there are later ones, but this is, was the, the lastest, late, uh, last, latest uh, estimate of the cost project. So the, the US sales price at the time, this is 2016, was $649. Of these uh, Apple uh, bought components from other uh, uh, knowledge economy producers, including Samsung, uh, for $220, about a third. But the most interesting line here is the next one, the manufacturing cost, the wages of the workers who put the phone together. And even if we had the profits of the contractors, who uh, uh, employed these workers, they together, all the workers and all the subcontractors got 0.8% of the sales price. And this means that the rest of it, two thirds, were pure profits to the designers and to the shareholders. This is also an aspect of the knowledge economy which we shouldn't forget. One other thing about uh, uh, social knowledge uh, I've uh, to some extent hinted at already, but I, said I would like to sum it up under the rubric of the dialectics 
of social cognition. That uh, 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 social cognition, trying to learn about society and about the social, is always involves the handling of contradictions and conflicts and tensions. And this is what I mean by uh, the dialectics of social cognition, which we all have to be aware of. There is, uh, uh, if you uh, just think back to my first point about the abundance of social knowledge, uh, there is the dialectic between the respect we owe to every human being and the knowledge she or he has. But on the other hand, we also have the responsibility as, as scholars to critique unreliable, unstable, biased knowledge. This may involve uh, uh, demands for tact uh, and it, it, the, the way in which, I mean, the respect and the critique may depend, the, the, will depend, I mean, on, on the context. There's no uh, fixed thumb rules or how to deal with this. It's something we all of us have to cope with. As scholars, we are, we are all uh, uh, committed to empirical investigation. And, and the empirical, uh, the most natural thing about the, the empirical is that it's something which exists, isn't it? That, that right, we are looking at it. What does it look like? Or what's the shape of it? And so on. But we also have, as particularly as, as social scholars, have to make an empirical investigation of what, what, not only of what is, but also what is not, or what doesn't exist, what is missing, what is the absence in this picture, say of, of a city, for instance, or whatever. And very often, I'm not saying that this is always the case, but very often the, um, the, uh, the hopeful expectation of the world social fora can be used as a, uh, as a research strategy looking, investigating phenomena. You remember the slogan, another world is possible. Something which doesn't exist, but which might exist, or might have existed, or perhaps will exist in the future. And there is another problem with empirical investigation Empirical uh, 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 investigations have an inherently conservative bias. Conservative with a small c. In the sense that it's uh, the, na the na most natural thing and the most clearly establishable evidence is what is consolidated uh, whether it is an institution, a practice, or, or what have you. But uh, the, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, and there is also, well, I mean, in, 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 a, in this context, a, we are all trained in critical skepticism. Which is something I mean, we uh, which we uh, should apply all the time and everywhere. Not only uh, outside academia, but also to our peers, to our colleagues. And that's what we do. I mean, we have this institution of peer reviews. That's the institutionalization of, of of critical skepticism. But we also uh, this is not without its contradiction, because. Uh, uh, this might mean that we will miss something which is latent, something which is just emerging, 
which is not yet consolidated and perhaps might not fully develop. It might be an embryo which for some reason may be aborted. But it's our task as, as social scholars, I mean, to pay attention also to the latent, to the just emergent, to the embryonic. And um, I've already, I think, touched upon, I mean, the, the kind of dialectic in, of the local and the global. It means that uh, uh, we have to look at the, the global in the, in the local, in the, in the city, in the country, in the village, uh, how it's manifested there, and also how the globe, global society and global tendencies are made up of local and national variations or what have you. And finally, uh, there is the a kind of dialectic or the task of coping with the tension uh, between objectivity and self-reflexivity. As social scholars, uh, from our first student paper to uh, our retirement writings, we are committed to, or should be committed to, objective knowledge. Uh, this doesn't mean, I mean, that we, we have to be objective in the sense of the, um, uh, what's the name of it, of the, uh, the, the, the radio council in Sweden, or radio nämnden, or tv nämnden. It doesn't mean a commitment to, to diplomatic politeness. Or to say, okay, on the on the one hand it's this, and on the other hand is that. But it it as an objective scholar, you don't need to be polite, you don't need to be diplomatic. Very often you should be, and, and, and so on. I mean, it's a good thing in many many contexts. But that, that's not what I mean. Uh, it's a commitment to an objective truth claim. I claim that X is A, and not B A or not B, and and I have enough evidence. I have reliable evidence. Show it. Um, but it, I think most of us, I mean, would be better scholars if we also think about why are we interested? Why am why am I interested in this? Why am I interested in in inequality uh, instead of in uh, La Dolce Vita, or, or, or what have you, uh, um, or uh, uh, um, so we 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 have to have the the commitment to objectivity should also be combined with a kind of self reflexivity. We ask ourselves, okay, I mean, why am I interested in this, and and not in that. But whatever we do, I mean, we have a right to make a claim to objective truth. And our commitment is to that. So that's um, what I had to say about uh, uh, social knowledge. Let us now turn to something more concrete and, and, and specific, to uh, cities and urban, urban imaginations. Um, well, cities may be uh, defined as built human environments of a certain size and density. Nobody, there is no consensus of what, what this certain size and density is, and so on. And uh, it's noteworthy that when the when the United Nations in 2007 proclaimed, I mean, now uh, the majority of of humankind is urban. Uh, that did not, in any sense, re, re, uh, reflect an, an, an objective truth. Because uh, uh, what was urban was defined by different, different, 
different states and different territorial jurisdictions. So it could be, I mean, uh, 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 dense agglomerations of uh, 20,000 people or more, or of 3,000 people or more. And I think in, in, in one jurisdiction it was a, a dense settlement of at least 200 people. So, uh, uh, this is, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is, this is what we have to, what we have to deal with. But I think the, the crucial thing is, is to see cities as built human environment. Uh, something which is sometimes lost in, in, in many perspectives of this city. I've quoted here a, uh, a wonderful quote from classical great urbanist Louis Mumford in, in a book from the late 1930s, that cities are points of concentration of power and culture of their community. Urbanization became a, a buzzword uh, uh, after this UN proclamation of the urban majority of humankind in 2007. And it, I think we can now say that uh, urbanization has now succeeded globalization as the most buzzy, buzzy word around, so to speak. Reurbanization uh, 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 I use here um, to refer to the post industrial transformation of industrial cities. I mean, it's a, it's a major process in all over the, in the industrialized uh, uh, world and is particularly relevant, of course, to, to Malmö. Although Malmö is by no means unique in being involved in a major process of, of reurbanization. So, if we look at the contemporary literature on cities and, and urbanization, which is now uh, uh, accelerating in, in, in uh, uh, size and, and numbers and so on, uh, we can distinguish three different perspectives uh, as, the, as the dominant ones. This is not a, an exhaustive list, but it's, it's a, uh, uh, it gives you a, um, uh, gives you the main, the main lines. Uh, one is a, a, what we may call an eagle perspective, which looks at cities from very high up, where cities rather uh, look like specks uh, in the global economy of network lines of business transactions and communications. You don't see any, any social life in these cities. You see them as points in, in these uh, uh, network lines. Um, the the Ur text of this perspective was written by a Los Angeles uh, a planner, a very nice man, uh, John Friedman in 1982. So it's a rather recent uh, perspective. But it, it made a, really made it and became a hit in, in 1991, when Saskia Sassen published The Global City, with absolutely perfect timing, uh, right after the uh, transformation of New York, London, and Tokyo into what she calls global cities. Um, it was a, uh, as a result of important uh, uh, and sometimes bitter uh, conflicts within each of these three cities about the orientation of the city. And in each of them, uh, 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 latest in, in Tokyo, the, uh, the globalists won. And then uh, uh, Saskia published this, the global city. Now, uh, she's a much too sophisticated, and for that matter, progressive sociologists to, to function uh, very well in, in, in the uh, role of booster of 
global cities. So, um, even though uh, uh, Sassen's uh, uh, book is the, the classical text uh, uh, and uh, most widely read, I think the, the more representative of the genre is uh, the, uh, uh, are, the, are the works of Peter Taylor, a British uh, geographer at Lowbury University who has recently timed up with a, a, a group of Chinese uh, geographers and economists uh, they uh, are publishing uh, a number of uh, works of which this global urban analysis of 2011 is probably the uh, was the was the start of this series. Uh, and 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 this perspective, the global city perspective, is is of course the lens through which. A lot of urban planners and urban managers and urban politicians look at their own city and the world. And so on. Not the least in Malmo and in Stockholm. And so on. You can really uh, uh, see. It. And uh, their colleagues all over the world in, in Seoul, in Buenos Aires, in Delhi, in Bangalore, in Nairobi, and so on. I mean, everybody wants to be a global city. Um, so that's one uh, uh, perspective. Uh, it has uh, taken a hit in in recent years, uh, and I think it's it's much less, uh, at least intellectually, much less powerful than it was ten years ago or fifteen years ago. Although it may still be uh, the the um, mostly one of the one or two mostly read books by urban managers and planners and boosters uh, of the world. The reason why it has lost a great deal of its, or some of its attraction, was that it completely misjudged the, the relation between these so-called global cities and the nation state. Uh, arguing that uh, these global cities, not only the original trio which Saskia Sassen had identified, Tokyo, London and New York, but other global cities all over the world uh, were becoming autonomous of the nation state and cutting loose from the national economy. And then came the financial crisis of 2008. And what happened then? Where did the bankers of Wall Street or of the city of London, where did they run for cover and for help? They ran to the, to the mayor of New York or uh, uh, bankers of other global cities? No. They went to the National Treasury in Washington. Or they went to 11 Downing Street in London, the treasury of Great Britain. I wrote a, a, a paper about this, so I called it the end of a paradigm. That might have been a bit of wishful thinking, but nevertheless, I think uh, uh, the, uh, this perspective uh, has a somewhat weaker standing than it had before the financial crisis. There is a, 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 um, a tradition of looking at, at cities as a way of life. There's a famous article um, by a Chicago, uh, a sociologist of the Chicago School, Louis Worth, from the late 1930s, on urbanism as a way of life. And he, in turn, was very much inspired by a great German sociologist of the uh, philosopher of the early 20th century, Georg Simmel, who um, published a long essay in, two, in 1903 on uh, uh, Die Großstadt und das Geistesleben. Uh, 
uh, which perhaps, I mean, uh, in contemporary English had better be translated as, as something like uh, metropolis and psychology. Um, now, uh, after World War II, when sort of urbanization became, if not yet, the majority of humankind, in the, in the rich world it became, urbanism as a way of life became a bit banal. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, idea of coming to grips with what, what does urban life mean uh, was no longer that much interesting. Um, and therefore, this, that kind of perspective uh, has more or less sort of faded away. And instead, uh, uh, there has come a, a focus on cities as locales of culture. And de facto of, of, of high culture. Or cities as locales of cultural creation and of cultural creators. Um, I've uh, listed two examples of this literature. One is uh, a, a kind of summing up of a long history of urban cultural history uh, by Peter Hall, Cities in Civilization. And the, uh, the most fashionable one uh, is the one by Richard Florida, Cities and the Creative Class. And that's a, that's a book which you can can find, I think, on the um, uh, bed table of many urban planners and managers and so on. I mean, uh, we have to make our city a creative city and, and uh, attract the creator, the creative class. Um, I don't know whether uh, these people have read Richard Florida's uh, latest book which is a, uh, really a, an interesting step back, I mean, from the hype of the, of the creative class, uh, served by the service class, and then uh, uh, presiding over the, the working class. That was the, and, and everything is sunshine and creation and prosperity and wealth and uh, uh, multi, uh, uh, multicultural sexuality uh, in, in Florida's uh, uh, previous books. And now he has, it is, well, sorry, last year, uh, he published a book called The New Urban Crisis. So now the crisis has reached, uh, if not Florida, at least Richard Florida, who is now in Toronto and was hit by the crisis there. Um, uh, that I think, I mean, is is a book which urban managers had better to uh, take a look at. Um, but I think this this perspective uh, is much too focused on uh, the so-called creators and the creative class and high culture, and uh, pays virtually no serious attention to ordinary people. That, that uh, uh, certainly uh, 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 is valid, I mean, for Florida um, before his latest autocritique. Uh, and it's largely uh, uh, correct also for Peter Hall and other uh, great cultural historians of, of cities, Karl Schorsky, Richard Sennett. Uh, and others. Then the third perspective, I think, is 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 growing in importance, uh, which I've uh, a bit irreverently called the frog perspective, um, because it it means looking at the city from below, and sometimes I mean literally from uh, from the underground. Uh, it goes back to a longer tradition of uh, looking at the city as a specific form of social organization. 
This was something which the Chicago School uh, uh, developed in the 1920s, Robert Park um, and others, uh, focusing on um, the uh, different forms of urban growth. Um, and there was also an interesting architectural variant of this, which I haven't listed here, but I think I'll take the freedom to mention because it's really an impressive work uh, by Spiro Kostov. Um, two books, uh, uh, one The City Shaped and the other The City Assembled, which deals with the architectural and planning elements of a city and how they are put together. Uh, streets, squares, grids, um, and, and, and uh, buildings of various kinds. But the, the major example of the frog perspective these days is a, uh, uh, a perspective which is uh, programmatically anti-state was to look at the the state. Uh, sorry, was to look at the the city below the state and uh, below state politics. Uh, it has become very popular in in the United States with the um, in liberal academia with the frustration of liberal American academics with national politics. First, there was the gridlock Congress, which made uh, Obama basically a lame duck, although he was a good liberal. And now, of course, I mean, the, uh, Donald Trump is uh, uh, the archetype of, the, of an illiberal president. So instead, uh, uh, there is now a uh, an attempt, I mean, to to look uh, beneath and below the state, uh, and uh, there are several books in this in the same genre. The the one we started this wave was by the now late uh, 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 political scientist Benjamin Barber. If mayors rule the world, well, then everything would be fine, and so on. I mean, we get rid of states and and politicians. And so on. Um, a <clears throat> perhaps much more interesting and much more profound study uh, uh, is uh, the uh, one by two British uh, geographers, very sophisticated gentlemen, uh, Ash Amin and Nigel Frift, Seeing Like a City. The title is taken from uh, a... Canadian uh, political scientist, Warren Magnuson, who started this kind of anti-state uh, look at the, at the city, who in turn, I mean, it's, a, it's an allusion to a, an anarchist, semi-anarchist classic of political anthropology, which some of you have, may have read, uh, uh, James Scott's book, from 1998, seeing like a state. Um, uh, Magnuson took up that uh, challenge uh, uh, very much programmatically and politically. Amin and Frist are more concerned with the materiality of the, of the city and they have a particular focus on the infrastructure of cities. And they are also quite inspired by uh, Bruno Latour and his uh, specific materialist perspective on, on, on human relations and objects in, in human relations. Well, okay, these are the, 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 the three uh, uh, major perspectives. The, the two first, I think, are in at least some decline, uh, although they have been very influential among urban managers. Um, the third one is, is probably growing, 
Uh, certainly, I mean, the political program is, is going with the politics of the United States. I think, I mean, they have all of them uh, uh, inspired uh, interesting research. And many of them, I mean, are great scholars. I mean, Saskia Sassen, Peter Hall, I mean, and, and, and Thrift, for instance. Um, but I do think, I mean, they have severe limitations. I think they are reductionist in, 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 in a way. They are reductionist in, in, in uh, the, the eagle perspective completely neglects, I mean, the uh, urbanity and uh, urban life. And so in this perspective, I mean, cities became no more than zip codes of corporate headquarters. Um, and they also, I think, are empirically wrong about the significance of the nation state, which I think they have uh, underestimated, and I think the financial crisis. Uh, the, the focus on the creators and, and on high culture, I think, uh, uh, neglects the majority of city populations. And in that sense, I mean, is a pretty narrow elitist uh, reductionism. The frog perspective, I think, is, is wrong in trying to wish away the state and national politics and international politics. It's there, uh, uh, regardless of whether you like it or not. And it, it's not going to, to disappear in the foreseeable future. So uh, I've developed a a somewhat different perspective, which I call uh, a perspective of a political flaneur. Uh, this is a bit of a uh, self-irony, uh, uh, of course, but I thought I shouldn't uh, uh, put on any uh, special hairs, I mean, given the slightly ironic titles uh, of the others. Um, and uh, uh, some of you may know me as I more as a political rebel than a flaneur, but, but uh, and, and that's not something I take as an insult, on the contrary, as a compliment. But uh, uh, I'm also very much a flaneur, and the, this perspective actually, I mean, developed walking around uh, Budapest in the mid-1990s. Um, I was in Budapest in the mid-1990s, uh, 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 having a, a so-called European Chair of Social Policy financed by the European Union. And uh, I had plenty of free time. And, uh, you know, Hungarian, I mean, is a little useless language, I mean, like Swedish. Uh, so there wasn't much uh, 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 idea of, of learning Hungarian. So instead, I mean, I, I spent my time walking around the city uh, which has a very dramatic history and so on. I mean, the, uh, um, the conflict between the Magyars and the Habsburgs, the, the Budapest Commune of 1919, uh, the white counter-revolution, uh, which then governed, I mean, for 25 years, uh, the coming of communism in the uh, 1945, and the going of communism in 1989. Uh, so there was lots of things to, 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 uh, to look at and see how these different political changes manifested themselves in the layered history of the city. And I, I was fortunate in, in, in uh, uh, getting hold of a couple of excellent essays by Hungarian urban historians uh, published in English. Um, and the flaneur has, has something in common, something very important with the scholar. A flaneur is, is someone who is strolling the city because she or he is curious, uh, wants to see new things, how is urban life developing, what is happening in the city. I mean, uh, 
oh, there is a new building, I haven't seen that before, or that one has disappeared, or what is happening there. So, I mean, always, uh, as a flaneur, I mean, you are collecting images of, of cities, scenes, urban scenes and buildings. Um, I was like that, so, um, and, well, uh, the, the um, putting in short, this perspective, uh, 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 written by someone, I mean, who wrote books, uh, as uh, Tapio uh, reminded you of, or like, uh, what does the ruling class do when it rules, or the uh, ideology of power and the power of ideology, it was natural, I mean, to approach the city uh, from a political perspective. Um, and I see cities uh, as situated in multiple contexts of power. And cities themselves as manifestations of power and of counter power. Now, I have spoke long enough, I know, so I, I, I want to sort of uh, read, I mean, these six key variables and so on. I mean, they, they, they are there and they are, uh, they are in, the, in the book. But that's what, I'm, uh, what I've looked at in these uh, cities of power. Um, Um, but we should uh, uh, say something more general about the social dynamics of cities, and uh, which is something I have started to think systematically and seriously yeah, uh, about when thinking about you and, and about this this lecture today. So. Um, I think uh, we can see and analyze cities as situated in a triangle of of of, of uh, variables uh, of territory, capital, and people. And the 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 point is that all these three are currently rapidly changing. The uh, uh, modern uh, uh, constitution of, of territory was the, was the nation state. And the nation state remains important, I think, and, and, and uh, no so-called global city, I mean, Escape from it, and New York City. I mean, is 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 dependent, even uh, uh, not even uh, not only. I mean, on the nation state, but on the state of New York, uh, which sets the taxation rules and the planning rules uh, for the city of New York. But, and this is what is uh, uh, important to stress. Uh, this kind of territory surrounding cities is changing uh, even while nation states keep their prominence and their power. They are changing because of the uh, uh, economic changes, the deindustrialization, new economic geographies uh, are being created. They are changing because of geopolitical changes. Um, the unification of Europe, for instance, of East and West, and uh, the uh, the new initiatives of of China connecting spaces all over the world, not only the the uh, uh, Silk Road initiatives called One Belt One Route, but other places. And you can see that very vividly, of course, uh, here in this city the territorial surroundings of Malmö have changed radically in the last, well, have changed radically since I lived here in the 1960s. With the coming, I mean, of the bridge 
of the Orison region, the Oristot concept. And uh, we have the, um, the changes, the ongoing changes and the discussion of how to change the regional organization of, of the Swedish state. The establishment of, of Scania as a uh, particular region, but it's part of a, a, a regional complex which is still in flux in, in this country. So uh, the territories in which, societies, in which cities have to uh, navigate are changing rapidly. Capital is... Uh, uh, changing with the financialization of capitalism and uh, with the upscale of capitalism in, in global, the global upscaling of capitalism. I, I pointed one, one figure at the, at the, um, in, in, the um, in 1963, the five richest individuals and, or families in Sweden together owned 1.17% of the Swedish GDP. In 2016, the five richest owed 23.5 percent, almost a fourth of the of the GDP. An enormous change, which is the the upscaling of, of capitalism, and which has a particular importance to cities, because many of the new uh, leading industries of capital accumulation are particularly urban. Uh, finance, real estate, the so-called event industry, uh, digital design, uh, and so on. All of them are uh, particularly urban cities. I mean, I, an enormous increase in the power and influence of capital over cities. But any uh, urban history uh, can, uh, ha has to uh, uh, take into account the people and popular contestations of power. City history is not just a history of power, but a, a, a also a history of contestations of power, of counter-power. In, in Europe, this was primarily uh, made up of the organized labor movement and the working class. Which led to the phenomenon sometimes referred, referred to as municipal socialism. Malmö, of course, I mean, was a classical example. I mean, the origin of, of the Swedish, Swedish labor movement. Uh, but that kind of people, which laid the basis of municipal socialism, has changed radically. And instead of an organized working class, we have a fragmented and ethnically divided and often very little organized uh, population. There are other uh, uh, ways of urban movements, counter, pro, uh, counter movements and protests and uh, uh, coming up. Um, so uh, the, the end of the centrality of the organized labor movement is not the end of urban protest and urban movements, but it's, it's changing. It's a new, it's a new challenge. And we shouldn't forget that at least in 2014, uh, uh, Malmö was almost a perfect more was a model example of a dual city between on the one hand i mean what we see here so i mean this building and the surroundings of, and and uh, on the other hand that in 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 2014 of all the 290 municipalities in sweden malmo had the largest proportion of poor people It's time to, uh, to close. I think that the, uh, uh, 
this new University of, of Malmö has a triple vocation. I think it first has a, 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 a vocation as a carrier or a practitioner of self-reflection, self-reflective conception of knowledge and knowledge production, which includes, or has to include, an awareness of the inherent ambiguity of knowledge, including its potential for exploitation and domination, as well as for emancipation and growth. So. And I do think, I mean, this is, I have the impression uh, that uh, this is something which the university leadership, this self-reflective perspective, is something which the university leadership has or are, is making its vocation. Uh, that's why, perhaps, you launched this series of Knowledge for Change, which is, is a, a way of, of uh, reflecting on... on uh, well, and I think it, it should include also what I have uh, talked about here, an awareness of the dialectics of social cognition, uh, an awareness of the tensions, conflicts, contradictions, which we all of us have to deal with. And secondly, the location of Malmö, I, I think, makes a uh, provincial university unimaginable or impossible or non-viable. I mean, uh, located close to two older universities of London, Copenhagen, and located in, in, in a city which is a, uh, an entry port into the country. The, the, the vocation of Malmö University has to be global. And in a very strong sense, uh, with, with a mission to, to function as a kind of global watchtower of the country. And, and thirdly, I think the university also has a special responsibility and a special possibility to engage with the city and to make uh, urbanity one of its vocations, an urban vocation, for two reasons. One uh, is the, the, the fact that the, the city of Malmö has already shown its engagement with social science and uh, social medicine and, uh, and uh, in, in the uh, excellent work of the Malmö Commission. There is a, a potential audience uh, uh, for uh, academic uh, you know, uh, knowledge production in the city. And on, at the same time, you have this practical challenge of the duality of the city and the powerless of the many in relation to the power of the uh, successful managers of, of the city. So there is also a, a vocation uh, to the city uh, relating, I mean, to the people. Because after all, I mean, uh, 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 cities are not only, they are in the context of territories and, and capital, which are powerful forces to deal with. But cities are built by and built for people. And that is the, the hard core of an urban vocation. Thank you. You. Wow. Joran, you have really put uh, in your odyssey the whole title of our series, the city and our university into a, a very mind-provoking perspective. So I think we, uh, with this very knowledge, knowledgeable audience, we will open up the floor. So we have microphones, so please. 
We have two hands up there. Uh, start with Bill, and, then, and please uh, pr present yourself, so especially Jöran knows uh, who you are. Sounded like a rat. <laughs> we have a rat around here. Ja, visst. Okay, uh, my name is Bo Reimer. I'm professor of media communication studies here. University. Thank you for your talk. Can you hear me? Okay. Shall I? Is this is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm not going to hit you. I, I, I just want to listen to you. Are you sure? Um, I just want to have a question about your idea of the flaneur as your uh, suggestion to replace the idea of the eagle or the uh, frog or so on. And reminding of the article by Janet Wolf already in the 1980s about the invisible flaneurs, the whole point being that to be a flaneur, you have to be a man. The streets are not made for women to talk on. So my question is, is that a really good suggestion for a proposal of the idea of the research of being a flaneur, if that is something only half the population can be? Sorry, I, I, could, could, could you repeat that? I, 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 I missed your... So, uh, Janet, Janet Wolf in the article, The Invisible Flaneurs from yeah. the Natives, criticized the whole idea of the modernity tradition talking about uh, the flaneur in the sense that that was a position that was only a male position to have if you were a female on the streets mm -hmm. and so on. So, is that a good proposal for the motto for how to do urban studies? I think it's a, uh, I think it's a good uh, uh, metaphor, yes, because I mean, a, a Flaneur is, is a curious person, and a scholar is, uh, too. And, and uh, the, the fact, I mean, that that uh, uh, women uh, uh, were for long uh, uh, prohibited from being flaneurs. I don't think, I mean, uh, there was a time when women were not allowed to become university professors. And, and uh, I mean, that doesn't mean, I mean, that uh, it's, it's a bad thing to be a university professor. Uh, and, and now, I mean, uh, 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 women are flaneurs. And, and write uh, books about uh, strolling the street and so on. I mean, so it's, uh, uh, time has changed. And um, uh, like uh, uh, the, uh, the position, I mean, of a, of a um, well, not only a university professor, university student. I mean, I, uh, at the time, I mean, of the 19th century, I mean, in most countries, I mean, you couldn't have any, uh, any uh, uh, women students. But uh, that doesn't mean, I mean, that it's, it's a bad thing, I mean, to be a student. So, uh, I, 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 I don't see, I mean, that the, the concept of the flaneur is, is necessarily tainted with with uh, uh, masculinism, although it's, it, it is perhaps too, I'm, I'm not quite sure that, uh, whether uh, 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 the French language has adopted, I mean, the proper uh, female form of it, which would, be, of course, be flaneuse, but I haven't, I haven't seen that, I must say, but, yeah, no, so I, 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 I still think, I mean, that we can use the flaneur. Next question is from Jetman with a nice beard. 
Thank you. Uh, Peter Lindstrom from uh, um, uh, Associate Professor in Criminology. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a good exercise for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. It's, sometimes it's good to be bad at hearing and so on. I mean, you... <laughs> yeah. Right, hi. I'm Peter Lindstrom from uh, Stockholm, actually, a uh, criminologist, Associate Professor in Criminology. Uh, I'm a bit curious about your opinion about crime prevention in the urban area, and especially now when the police are going to enter the university, because uh, Malmö University will have police education from next year. And what is your general opinion about having um, crime prevention as an academic subject? My, my opinion about crime prevention? At the universities, yes. Hmm. I must say, I haven't given that serious question much thought, but um, so in that sense, I mean, you're learning something. Although I, I should say, I have some experience from Brazil where uh, several colleagues of mine are engaged in, uh, in, uh, how shall we put it? Well, the, the unofficial, the unofficial mission is to civilize the police which in Brazil is, is, is certainly an urgent need, but it's, it's very difficult. But they, they, uh, it means, I mean, that they have um, uh, uh, give courses, I mean, for, for uh, policemen on human rights and, and citizens' rights and so on. Um, and that, I think, I mean, is, is, a, is a good thing. On the whole, I mean, a, uh, um, universities have, have expanded its range of, of, um, of subjects in, in all directions. So, I mean, I, I, I can't see any very particularly strong reason why crime and prevention of crime, I mean, couldn't be uh, something which universities worked, worked on. About. Ian, Professor Emeritus, this university. Uh, I'd like to continue uh, with the aspect of the planeur, but from another uh, point of view. Uh, and, uh, and that is the planeur, I guess, as we understood him from uh, Baudelaire to Benjamin or whatever. Mm. has a kind of disinterest uh, is exactly very curious mm. finding things but and then I'm wondering in the context of knowledge for change mm. what are you advocating a, a flaneur role for the social scientist or other scientist at Malmö University when it comes to to dealing with the social issues that we are confronting, or is this in opposition to some kind of more engaged activism? And mm. So that's my question. Mm. That's that, that's a very important question, and, and I'm, I'm glad you, you you brought it up because I mean uh, I I didn't make my myself quite clear. Uh, I talked about the the perspective of studying cities as uh, uh, located in contexts of power uh, and, uh, I, I, as it's the perspective I developed my own I, 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 I given given its uh, etiology in, in my strolling in Budapest I, I gave it the, the ironic self-ironic uh, 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 name of the perspective called the flaneur, uh, but it. I hope it, it it came out in in the rest of what I say that that I'm certainly I mean uh, 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 the urban vocation, which I talked about. I mean for the university, Malmo University, for instance. I mean it's certainly a vocation of urban engagement, and. Um, 
it, it, it's, I mean, uh, going back personally and so on, uh, uh, for a moment again, I mean, it, it, it's true that I, I find a great pleasure, I mean, of, in strolling cities, I mean, strolling around, I mean, like a, like a flaneur. But that's only, I mean, part of my life. I mean, a, a good main part of my life, I mean, is I, uh, oh, how should I put it, a fighter. Uh, for uh, for equality and for uh, uh, emancipation and so on and, and so uh, I mean uh, uh, there was absolutely no um, implication I mean that this kind of <coughs> coolly disinterested watching uh, 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 gaze of the typical flaneur uh, should be adopted uh, as I as an urban vocation. On the contrary, uh, and um, I think it comes out also in the in the uh, book *Cities of Power*. I mean that I'm I'm very much engaged in what had happened. I mean, two two cities under different constellations of power. It matters. It's certainly not a disinterest. But uh, uh, thank you. I mean, for bringing it up. And it was my fault. I should have should have been uh, uh, clarified that uh, 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 from the very beginning. So, thank you. Please. Hello. Um, I am a student, so I will start with a question. Can the subaltern speak? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hi. My name is Juliana Varudi. I am a student in Urban Studies Department. Mm. So can the subaltern speak? Yes, thank you. I would like to ask, you have uh, spoken clearly about the inequality between the successful managerial creative class and the service mm. um, powerless and poor layer of urban societies. And my question is, I don't know how, is this better? like this. Hmm. Um, how do you think um, we should relate to a higher level? I want to speak about the designers and the conceivers of the smart city, the entire artificial intelligence which is um, being conceived as an infrastructure, which is at this point maybe instrumental. But how about if it becomes controlling, formatting? normative for the social functioning of the city? That's one question. And the other one, how do you think we can relate to another invisible layer of service? And here I, I'm thinking of the people who are literally producing food far away from the city, sometimes even far away from Sweden, the of, hinterland. Of, of, uh actual production far away from the city. The farmers, also in the context of um, farmland grabbing and foraging. Mm, 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 Well, the, the, the uh, first question, I think we uh, should be aware of, I mean, the enormous uh, inequalities which uh, the digital revolution, I mean, has, has produced. Uh, and uh, um, uh, the, the enormous monopolization, I mean, uh, uh, which has taken place, uh, I mean, Amazon is now, I mean, the, the bookshop, I mean, for the whole world. And, and Google, I mean, is the search engine uh, for all the world. Uh, and, uh, and so on. I mean, it's, it's, um, uh, and it's, uh, the designers of these products have become immensely uh, rich. Uh, and this has been, being reproduced, I mean, in the in, in new forms of of, of digital um, uh, design, and um, 
the uh, the big question is, I mean, whether the uh, coming of artificial intelligence on a big scale, when and, and how it will come, I mean, it could uh, really, I mean, blow up the existing social relations and, and, and economic relations um, in a uh, sort of nightmarish way. And it's interesting, I mean, that some of these, some of these, some of the uh, people, I mean, who have made or benefited from, I mean, the first digital revolution, I mean, are now themselves worried, I mean, with what will happen, I mean, with the coming of, of artificial intel intelligence. Uh, so this is something, I mean, which all of us have to think about, although I, I have no particular idea of how to cope with it, but it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic challenge um, and uh, uh, can very much, I mean, change human relations in the second half of the 21st century. The, uh, the other thing you mentioned uh, uh, is something which, uh, which is happening, but it's more, it's more tangible and something, I mean, which uh, we have some means to deal with uh, in, in case, I mean, we, we have the uh, uh, have the power. Uh, I mean the the manufacturing. I mean for the uh, uh, designer industries in 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 the rich world. I mean for uh, Adidas or Nike or uh, Apple or uh, uh, or what have you. Uh, or for that matter, for H and M, the uh, Bangladeshi uh, uh, workers uh, uh, who work for them. Um, and uh, we also have quite a new phenomenon, which is uh, an interesting return to old colonial uh, practices, I mean, of the 19th century, this uh, land gra grabbing <coughs> by, by uh, some countries, uh, uh, purchasing very cheaply uh, uh, enormous tracts of land, I mean, from poor countries in, mainly in Africa, but to some extent in some countries in Latin America as well. Um, uh, but that is, uh, that, that is something which is, which is part of, I mean, the capitalism we know of and the, the social conflict we know of, I mean, the, and has to be dealt with, I mean, in the classical means of of, of, of social struggle and the uh, uh, the strengthening of the uh, popular forces in countries like Bangladesh or uh, the so-called Democratic Republic of Congo and so on. Uh, and that is that's already, I mean, uh, 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 on the agenda. Your, your first question is is more distant but more difficult I mean to to um, cope with but you belong to the generation I mean which will have to find a solution to it and so on uh, uh, lucky in perhaps not having to uh, to do that <laughs> we have two final questions please hi uh, my name is Bjarne Teiden um, I'm a bachelor student here um, in international migration and ethnic relations um, you seem rather critical when talking about the eagles and the frogs of um, the notion that cities could be the counterpoint to the nation state or like new centers of um, like working class power. Um, but at the same time, um, your last sentence was, for example, um, how was it again? No, um, I forgot it. Uh, shit. Um, uh, yeah, right. Uh, buildings are built uh, for, from people for people. Um, but this isn't necessarily the case. Um, for example, when we look at gentrification, where buildings are built, uh, well, uh, affordable housing is being destroyed in order to build mm -hmm. uh, business sites or um, elite housing that isn't actually affordable for uh, working class people. And so in order to overcome that, uh, we actually need um, municipal socialism again. 
um, like a hundred years ago, for example. So I come from Vienna and like I'm... <laughs> ah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like you that. have a, an uh, heritage to be proud of. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, and once that has happened, hopefully, um, that we get back to municipal socialism that uh, enables us to have um, housing from the people for the people, um, then we have centers of power in these cities. Um, and shouldn't we use them then to try to overcome the nation state? Um, in a sense, like the, the eagles think, but in a very different way. Mm. Um, well, I mean, uh, 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 when, I, when I said that uh, cities are not only built by people, but they are also built for people, the, the four people, I mean, that was uh, more a kind of an... an, an an expression of a norm and of a moral, uh, uh, moral conception. I mean, of, of urbanism and so on. I, I'm quite aware of. I mean, processes of gentrification or the eviction of of um, uh, poor populations from large tracts of urban land and so on. I mean. Uh, 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 but they. Well, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the problem with uh, municipal socialism, if you just take that, even, even if, I mean, you, do, you can't make it in, in Vienna anymore because the SPÖ, I mean, doesn't have, have the, the power and the social base anymore, I mean, to, to, uh, uh, to do that. So, um, and, uh, but the, the, the main reason is that, I mean, cities are still, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, still intrinsically dependent on nation state, particularly for crucial decisive questions, like the kind of social order, economic order, or the political order, and so on. Uh, after all, as you know, and so on, I mean, the municipal socialism in, 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 in Vienna was crushed by the, by the nation state, by the development of Austro-fascist politics. And um, uh, that's why I think it's, it's a dangerous illusion to, to think of uh, cities without states. But having said that, I would say that, I mean, uh, what I'm against is the kind of the reductionist idea of if mayors rule the world and seeing like a city and not like a state, uh, but uh, uh, treating the whole thing em empirically. I mean, I, I've become fascinated with several examples of uh, urban reform governments in, in various cities of the world, um, in Delhi and in Montevideo, for instance, and for a while even in, in in Jakarta. So, I mean, uh, there is a, uh, a, a possibility uh, uh, in the contexts of power in which cities live for uh, radical urban reform governments in all kinds of countries. But there is a certain basic limit and so on. And, and the idea that, that cities can replace states and overtake states, I think, is at least for this century, a, a, an illusion. Uh, final question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very interesting speech and, and offering us the, the possibility to listen to you and, and all the things that you've done and now the work on cities. And my name is Håkan Johansson. I'm a professor in social work at Lund University. And I'm doing a little bit of research on, on cities. And I, I think perhaps I might challenge you a little bit that it might be that these three perspectives on cities could be complemented with potentially at least a fourth perspective, seeing the cities as arenas or spaces where people actually meet to discuss and deliberate and perhaps even come to decisions on common things. And, and I mean, in social science, we've used the metaphor of the square to illustrate how, how cities could form such a, an arena for, for public discussions and so on. Mm. And uh, I think that if one reads, for instance, the, the new urban agenda by the UN, there is great hopes that this, this view on the cities is still there. 
So I would very much like to hear your view on, on could the cities still be this, this function as the arena where, where the metaphor of the square, where people actually meet to discuss their, their common problems within the cities, and especially in the light of, of more the structural changes that you are picturing, but also that the cities now, they tend to be fairly big. I mean, they, they people are, there are many millions of people living in the cities and the great social polarization within the cities, which of course makes the possibilities of having a square much more, more limited. So do you think that mm. there is still the, the view of the square uh, uh, for, for the inhabitants of our present cities? Is that still around? Well, cities are where strangers meet. And that includes also stranger disciplines. Uh, where uh, social work means demogra meets demography and architecture, political science, economics, uh, and so on. Uh, so in, in that sense, um, cities and, and, and urban research and urban discourse uh, is a de facto, I mean, a, a fascinating meeting place. Um, this, uh, 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 on the other hand, I mean, they, they, there is a, uh, 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 there is also, well, I mean, I, that, uh, I, 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 I don't think I would uh, quarrel with your idea of, uh, the idea of an arena where, where uh, uh, people not only meet, but where perspectives meet and fight. Um, and, and that's certainly, I mean, what is, uh, what is happening. Um, and I'm looking forward, I mean, to a, uh, to a fight we'll have at the next uh, sociology congress in, in Toronto uh, about uh, seeing like a state or seeing like a city. Um, uh, so in, in, in that sense, I mean, I, I basically uh, agree with you. And, and uh, I think, I mean, and, and I said that explicitly, unprovoked, that uh, I think there is a great deal of, of, of um, interest in, and, and value in all these perspectives and so on. Uh, but there are also issues uh, uh, in which we disagree and disagree quite fundamentally. And, and then, uh, 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 the, the, the meeting becomes not a square, but an, uh, an arena. Not an agora, but, uh, but an, an arena of intellectual and scholarly battle. And, um, but that's also something, that's part of the, the development of, of scholarship and, and, and science and so on. And, and, uh, you, um, you keep your cool and, and, and uh, your respect for the, for, the, for the person of your colleagues uh, and your peers, and then you, you fight it out. Mm. <laughs> and we have many arenas. Joran's uh, uh, lecture will be also an essay on the website. So spread it to colleagues and so on. And I... Uh, um, greet you all welcome to forthcoming uh, seminars in this series. But now I think we will give Jöran a warm applaud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.